Okay, we'll continue and we still have some very interesting discussions left. Now, as we move forward, I have with me here a young lady who belongs to Srinagar, Indian occupied Kashmir. She lives in Islamabad. She was very young when her family moved from Srinagar to Muzaffarabad. She remains in contact with the young Kashmiri activists in the universities and colleges in Srinagar and the rest of uh, the, the Kashmiri cities, and also with uh, young Kashmiris who are studying in various uh, universities in India, across India. So, and she's been in contact with them. So we have uh, about 10 minutes, and I will invite Shaista Safi to tell you her experience of being daily in touch, in contact, with the young men and women of Kashmir right now who are behind <clears throat> this peaceful movement for freedom. And Shaista will tell you exactly how these young women, Kashmiri young Kashmiri women and young Kashmiri men actually involve and get involved in this activism with the presence of an occupation military force and with the presence of all the paramilitaries that, that are there and continue to do their work every day. So, Shaisa, thank you very much. You have the floor. Bismillah rahmani rahim assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Minister, for your time. Thank you, Ahmed Qureshi, for your introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the topic today, which I'm going to discuss, will be, is Kashmir giving up a look at home from exile? I'll walk you through to home, my home, my Kashmir, and then we'll decide who's giving up. I was born in Baramulla, Indian occupied Kashmir, and I opened eyes in conflict. I was not one of those lucky people who were born when they used to say that Kashmir is a paradise on earth. I belong to the generation that is born that was born when there was a conflict going on and we have just seen Kashmir turning from the paradise to the largest open air cage in the world. My father was one of the people who uh, contested in elections in 1987 and these are those elections which were highly rigged and the winning contestants were put behind the bars and some authors write that this was the phase when Kashmiris chose the bullets and they rejected the ballots. Me and my family migrated to Pakistan in early 90s and to be very specific, we landed in Pakistan just a few days before the 90 World Cup cricket in, um, that Pakistan won and I still have the pictures of that small screen showing the Pakistani players holding that World Cup that shows how crazy Kashmiris still are for the cricket. As a child, I might have thought that as we moved away from the conflict zone, we are safe now. As we moved away from the conflict, we have left behind the conflict. But those who belong to conflict will understand the statement that whoever is born in a conflict or is born in exile or is somehow connected with the conflict, this conflict never never leaves them. If a person leaves the place, that place never leaves that person. Some of you, I hope many of you have seen the picture of little 20 months old Hiba, who was pelleted. Her eye, left eye was pelleted and she is now the youngest victim of pellet. This is not just a single case. This is not just the first case. Hundreds and thousands of Kashmiri children, they are scarred. Hundreds and thousands, they have these marks. Maybe you can't see them because they are, these scars are in their minds and their souls. Maybe Hiba is the only one you have seen, the youngest, the young one with a scar on her eye. But we have hundreds and thousands of Kashmiri youngsters, children who have these scars. 
And some people ask us, you're very young to have this hatred inside you. The picture of Hiba is the answer to those people that even this young girl, this 20 months old young girl is hit by pallets. And the scars of this occupation will remain there forever. And she'll remember these scars throughout her life. These are the things that the people and the children of occupation go through. We are not lucky enough like you people to read the stories of Rapunzel and Snow White. We have our own stories, Ma'am Minister. We grow up with the tragedy of Konan Koshpura. We grow up with the tales of Moniba, the bride who was raped on her wedding day. We grow up with Asiya and Nilofar rape case. And we even grow up today with Asifa Banu, the eight years old who was raped in a temple. Her parents didn't search her in a temple. They thought that this is the house of God. But she was raped there for eight days. This is how the children of conflict grow, ladies and gentlemen. Every day, we have to see the Indian occupational forces around us, fingering their triggers, stationed every 10 yards apart, passing lewd remarks, <coughs> staring at us. When we have to pass through the bunkers, we have to pass through the checkpoints. We have to prove our identity the people who belong to their, their Kashmir, we have to prove our identity to the aliens. We go through this every day and night. The question is, are Kashmir, Kashmiris giving up? Do you think that Asifa Bano will forget what happened to us, her? And do you think that we'll forget what she has been through? Do you think that 11 years old Mushtaq, who was palleted, his eye, both eyes, he's blinded of both eyes now. He used to love to read and to watch cricket, and now only thing he can do is to sit inside because because of the pallets, his eyes are light sensitive. He can't go outside. Can we forget Insha Mushtaq, a 14 years old girl, who was just sitting in her house, the safest place on the earth for anyone, but in Kashmir, even your house is not safe. You can be killed, you can be pelleted, even you, if you are sitting inside your house. She was just peeping outside the window to see what the noise is outside. And when the pallets, showers of pallets hit her and she was blinded in both her eyes. The good news is she just cleared her metric, metric exams. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the resilience. This is the re resilience that Indian occupation forces are facing every day. We, when talk about the conflict, the dilemmas of conflict, I always remember Insha Mushtaq's mother's words. I read once. She said that, I wish that instead of being blind, if my daughter was killed, this would have given me some relief. I would have overcome the grief. You just imagine the dilemma this conflict brings to the lives of people that a mother is wishing her daughter was dead because she can't see her deadly eyes every day. Those deadly eyes kills her every day. So this conflict brings a mother to say that, I wish my daughter was dead. You have to understand, and we all have to understand what this conflict brings to us. We have so many stories. We have so many people. Not a single house of Kashmir, you can say that, is safe from Indian occupation. We remember the mother of Sharjil, a groom-to-be. After the death of Sharjil, she said that, I don't want days to come. I just want, there should be always the night, because at night, my son talks to me. I can feel the warmth of his blood on my arms. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have to understand what people of Kashmir are going through. This is not just we hear a news that a person is killed. 
a 14 years old boy is dead. We hear that five people were killed yesterday. These are not just five people, five individual people. These are five families. They are friends to someone. They are brothers. They are their husbands, their father. We are killing, India is killing a full generation of Kashmiris. When we say it's a genocide happening, it's not just, it's not just a statement. It's the reality that a genocide is happening in Indian occupied Kashmir. But have we given up? By taking through to what's happening in Indian occupied Kashmir and bringing that happenings in just five or six months, it's never possible. But the thing is that we have seen the occupation, we have seen the killing, we have seen the rape, we have seen each and everything that can, an occupation can bring to us. But we never gave up. We are still writing. We are writing. If Kuram Parvez is writing structure of violence and he's not allowed to go out to present himself in UN, it's India who is giving up. If Asya Indrabi and Dr. Faktu, Ahmed and Muhammad are not giving up as a family, it's India who is giving up by putting Asya Indrabi in Tihar jail. If Kashmiris are not giving up even after their Twitter and Facebook account are disabled every time they post something about Kashmir, it's India who is giving up by gagging the internet every now and then. Ladies and gentlemen, I, as a Kashmiri, Shaisa Safi, guarantees you Kashmir will never give up. It's India who give us, gives up every day. As I was told that we have shortage of time, I was reading just at the end. I always quote something at the end of whatever presentation I do. I was reading an article written by Prime Minister Modi Sahab uh, on the anniversary of Gandhi. He wrote that Bapu's favorite line from a bhajan, his favorite bhajan is, Vaishnav janto tene kahiye ji, peed padhai jane re. The greatest souls are those who feel the pain of others. I wish that Modi ji soon feels the pain of Kashmiris they are going through. I thank you all. Thank you, Shaista, for a great presentation. And uh, I'm lucky to have had uh, long sittings with Shaista, questioning her and asking her about her experiences as a young child coming to uh, Azad Kashmir and then coming to Pakistan. And uh, I agree that the time that you were given is not enough to really cover the stories that she has to tell.